Hello and welcome to Buffy and the Art of Story Season 6, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer rewatch podcast that looks at one episode at a time, focusing on story elements to see what works and very occasionally what doesn't. I am Lisa M. Lilly, mystery and thriller author and story expert. If you want to support the podcast and get access to additional content, you can do that at patreon.com slash Lisa M. Lilly. That's L-I-S-A Emerson Marie L-I-L-L-Y. Today I'm talking about season six, episode 22, Grave, the second part of the two-part season finale where the gang tries to stop Willow from ending the world and Buffy has a breakthrough. Along with a recap of the episode, I'll talk about whether the protagonist for this part of the finale is Giles, not Buffy or the gang, why Xander is the one and only character who can save the world this time, whether Xander's worst traits are also his best, and how Buffy's story fits with the larger plot, if it does. As always, There will be no spoilers until the foreshadowing section at the end, but I'll give you plenty of warning. Okay, let's dive into the Hellmouth. Grave aired the first time on May 21, 2002, the same date as Two to Go, part one of the finale. This part was written by David Fury and directed by James A. Contner. As they both noted on the DVD commentary for the episode, this is the only season finale not written and directed by Joss Whedon. It starts at the midpoint of the two-episode arc, just after a major reversal for Buffy. At the midpoint of almost every strongly structured story, or any story at all, usually we'll see a major reversal for a protagonist, a major commitment by the protagonist, or both. Buffy's reversal happened at the end of the last episode, when she couldn't stop Willow from hurting Anya, who was doing the protection spell to keep Andrew and Jonathan safe. But the antagonist, Willow, suffered a reversal, too, because Giles appeared and sent her flying across the room using magic. Now Buffy's lying on the floor unconscious, and there is a bit of opening conflict for this particular episode. That's the conflict there to draw the viewer quickly in. And while we don't really need it in a two-part episode that airs on the same night, it works really well here since on rewatch, not everyone is going to look at those back to back. Willow gets to her feet. Giles tells her to stay down and she's on the floor again, at least for a moment. Anya asks how he did that. Willow observes that it's borrowed power. She also refuses when Giles tells her he wants to help her and says, thanks, but I can kill a couple geeks all by myself. Buffy, who is now awake again, tells Willow she should listen, that Buffy doesn't want to fight her anymore, but Willow thinks that's just fine. She doesn't want to fight Buffy. She wants to fight Giles, and she reminds him of the argument they had, as she puts it back when he was still under the delusion that he was relevant. She says, you called me a rank arrogant amateur. Well, buckle up, Rupert, because I've turned pro. And at one minute, 46 seconds, we go to the credits. So lots of conflict there. On return, Willow starts a spell, but Giles binds her in a circle of blue and green light. She's in a physical and magical sort of stasis. Buffy and Giles hug. He comments on Buffy cutting her hair. Anya points out that she's blonde now and joins the hug as Willow hangs there. Giles walks over and tells Willow he's very sorry about Tara, but Willow just warns him that this won't hold her forever. Around this point in a typical episode, 
we'd see the story spark or inciting incident for the main plot. In a way, there is one here because Giles' arrival is the spark for this half of the episode. And now he explains to Buffy as they catch up in the training room, just the two of them, that a coven told him of a dark force fueled by grief that was rising and the coven imbued him with their powers. He doesn't answer when Buffy asks if the coven sent him here to bring Willow down. Instead, he asks her what's been happening. Buffy tells him Willow was abusing the magic and Buffy didn't see it for a long time. Don's been stealing. Money's so tight, Buffy's slinging burgers at the double meet. Anya left Xander at the altar and is a vengeance demon again. And Buffy's been sleeping with Spike. After a second, Giles laughs, shocking Buffy, but then she laughs too. I get that we need Giles and Buffy to reconnect here. I wasn't sure we needed all this exposition about what happened in the season. It's not unusual to do some callbacks during a finale. At the same time, I mentioned last episode, there was a lot of repetition there between it and the previous episode. We're getting more of that here. And it adds to, for me, that feeling that this finale is a bit slow. Another thing is this aired the same day as two to go. And only a week after the previous episode, if you were watching in real time, as I was, you really felt that repetition. In the retail area of the shop, Willow uses telepathy to talk to Anya, who at first tells her that magic mind control doesn't work on a vengeance demon, but it clearly does. Willow draws Anya to her and explains how to defeat the binding spell. Buffy and Giles, in the meantime, are still laughing as she tells him about the events of normal again. And I find this part really fun, partly because she doesn't recap everything. We pick up more towards the end where Buffy says, all of it, you, Sunnydale, and I was just some nutcase in L.A. Giles responds, of course. Why didn't we see it before? Then he turns a little bit more serious and asks if she can forgive him and says he should never have left. Buffy tells him, no, you were right to leave. We're just stupid. Giles says, I know you're all stupid. I should never have abandoned you. Buffy responds, no, Giles, you were right about everything. It is time I was an adult. Giles tells her, sometimes the most adult thing you could do is ask for help when you need it. And Buffy says, now you tell me. Because Buffy forgives Giles for leaving, we forgive him too. So I think the episode needed this for the season end. And as I'm reading it now, I'm thinking, okay, I've been very skeptical of Giles leaving, focusing on how young Buffy really is and all this responsibility on her shoulders in addition to her Slayer duties. But in the universe of the show, maybe Buffy did need to be an adult. As the Slayer, she doesn't have and has never had the luxury of being young in the same way that a lot of other people do, not everyone, but a lot of people. And perhaps in a way, Giles did need to push her out of the nest because she has to face so many things and she couldn't just fall back on him even for emotional things. That being said, I still wish Giles had stayed around and I I think he would have had it not been for the actor wanting to step away for a bit. Now Buffy tells Giles she wasn't ready before to stand on her own, that the feeling that she wasn't really here took a long time to go away. And it was as if when she climbed out of that grave, she left part of her behind. Though she's feeling better now, she still doesn't understand why she's back. Giles tells her she has a calling, but Buffy responds that it was her time and, quote, someone would have taken my place, end quote. I'm not sure if that's true because we have not seen a new Slayer called, and it seems like when Buffy died the first time in season one, Kendra was called, Kendra died, Faith was called, Faith is now in prison, so I don't know that someone would have taken Buffy's place. I guess down the road, whenever Faith died. 
But at any rate, that's how she's seeing it now. And she asks Giles what will happen to Willow. Giles tells her the coven is looking for a way to extract Willow's powers while keeping her alive. But there's no guarantee she'll be the same person. And he goes on, Willow's killed a human being. How will she be able to live with herself? And a voice comes from the doorway, Willow's voice. I wouldn't worry about that. They look over and it looks like it's Anya, not Willow, with her eyes shut. And then Willow steps out from behind her. She is holding Anya's body. And at this point, I am pretty sure I thought Anya was dead, though we'll find out later she was only unconscious. Willow says, Willow doesn't live here anymore and drops Anya. And the scene goes to a commercial. So a great hook. If this were a single episode, we'd be pretty close to one quarter of the way through. And that's usually where we see the first major plot turn that comes from outside the protagonist, spins the story in a new direction and raises the stakes. And things are going to shift here because Willow knocks Buffy out before she can do anything. And when Giles tries to use magic, Willow uses her own spells to send knives that are displayed on the wall flying at Giles instead. In the DVD commentary, David Fury said he got some flack from fans because Willow used a similar move against Glory in season five. She pulled out all those knives and sent them flying at Glory. But his view was that if something works for a character, and that did do some damage to Glory, that the character is going to go back to that again, and that writers sometimes think they have to find something new all the time, but you should be true to the character. And that makes a lot of sense to me. You you want variety in your writing, but if you're going to write a strong, consistent character, strong meaning one that really resonates with viewers or readers, it fits that a character who fights, whether it's physically, magically, emotionally, is going to go to the things that have worked before. Giles blocks the knives, partly with that scarecrow from season five's checkpoint where the council was testing Buffy. And I love that callback to that episode and the fact that the scarecrow is still hanging around the training room. He now uses a spell to send Willow flying through a brick wall and into the retail area of the shop again. The scene cuts to Dawn and Xander. They're walking down a sidewalk in the dark, Jonathan and Andrew in tow. Dawn asks where they're going. Xander admits that he doesn't know. And as he did in the last episode, rambles about feeling useless and goes on, I can't even run away well, and that's something I'm usually good at. He talks more about being a coward because he didn't act when Warren pulled out the gun and couldn't stop Willow at the magic box. That part is new, but we heard all this about how he felt about not being able to stop Warren before, making it at least twice in one episode and adding to that slower pace. Dawn rightly tells Xander that feeling sorry for himself also isn't helpful. Then she goes on to say if Spike were there, he'd go back to the magic box and fight. And Xander says, sure, if he wasn't too busy trying to rape your sister. Dawn is shocked and says she doesn't believe him. Spike wouldn't do that. He then comments on the blind spot the Summers women have for Spike and says the only useful thing Spike ever did was leave town. This transitions us to the next scene at 11 minutes, 50 seconds, where Spike is in a cave looking very beat up. He has won another round of fighting with the demon and dares the demon to test him further if it'll get him, quote, what I need to take care of the Slayer, give her what's coming to her, end quote. It's clear the demon obliges because Spike says bloody hell as beetles crawl all over him. Then he screams as they burrow in. The scene cuts to the magic box, which is pretty much destroyed. Lights are sparking. There's a fire burning in one spot. 
Bookcases are toppled over and trashed. Ceiling beams have crashed to the floor. Willow stands amidst all of that and says, that all you got, Jeeves? Giles stands again but is exhausted. He tells her he can still hurt her and she says he doesn't get it nothing can hurt her now and she waves a hand and all the scratches and bruises on her face disappear and willow says this is nothing it's all nothing and we can tell she means everything that has happened all the grief all the sadness as well as the effects of the fight giles asks her what tara would say about that and she says he can ask her himself and shoots electric bolts at him buffy dives out to try to save him and willow is annoyed commenting about buffy always saving everyone and she goes on you probably even think you're buying escape time for jonathan and the other one continuing that joke about nobody knowing andrew's name or who he is willow now creates a fireball and says she can kill them from anywhere this fire will find them and bury them and anyone helping them. So that raises the stakes for Buffy because Xander and Dawn are helping Andrew and Jonathan. And it stresses how far Willow has come, showing us again that she is willing to kill Dawn and Xander. But for the moment, it's pretty clear she wants to distract Buffy. She says it will bury everyone unless someone somehow, quote, can get there in time to save them, unquote. She throws it, says, fly, my pretty fly, echoing the Wizard of Oz. Buffy looks distraught, but Giles tells her to go. She runs out to follow the fireball. Willow now lectures Giles on being a hypocrite, coming in with all this magic to tell her to be a good girl and behave. Magic's bad. The camera's been focusing on Willow during this scene. Now it shifts and Giles is flat on the ceiling. She sends him down to the floor, then flying up again, tells him she used to think he had all the answers and she could learn so much from him. But he was jealous of her power and still is that's why he ran away this is an echo of those scenes in the beginning of the season and i like that it hits some of those same themes i don't think giles is jealous of willow i don't think he was jealous I always read him as concerned at the same time. Their scenes together back then had some universal themes in there about mentor and mentee, about starting to catch up to the person you've learned from, and the dynamics of what is usually an older man, usually an older white man in many workplaces, telling a young woman that she doesn't know what she's talking about, not seeing her as powerful even when she is there is from willow's perspective a certain hypocrisy here and that frustration that giles is saying magic is bad for you but not for me though clearly as viewers we can see why that is the case giles now uses some magic on willow and it sets her back at least for the moment, and he tells her she's used up too much power. She's not as strong as she thinks. That prompts Willow to realize she can suck the power out of Giles. And she does that amidst crackling lights and more electricity. Willow falls back, gets a head rush, and drops against a wall at 17 minutes 18 seconds echoing that addiction metaphor again willow says who's your supplier wow it's incredible she's breathing hard and says no mortal person ever had this much power she feels connected to everything to everyone and she feels all this emotion and pain A patron, Rebecca, sent some comments about the scene where Spike assaults Buffy. I was puzzled by Buffy saying, ask me again why I could never love you, and then saying, because I stopped you. In between, Spike says, Buffy, oh my God, I didn't. And she cuts him off with, because I stopped you. And I read that and have seen it all these years as Spike starting to say he didn't mean to do it. So I linked Buffy's two comments together as if because I stopped you was a continuation 
of ask me again why I could never love you. And I, I never understood that. And Rebecca has explained why I never understood it because she points out something that I missed completely that now seems very clear. And maybe many of you were shouting that at me as you listen to the podcast. Here is what she says. I interpreted Buffy's ask me again why I could never love you as a closed thought. And because I stopped you, not as the answer to that, but as a response to Spike's Buffy, I didn't. Did I miss some nuance? Did Spike say Buffy, I didn't? Or did I imagine it? Or is it only in the subtitles and drowned out? Now that Rebecca said that, it makes perfect sense, and I'm pretty sure it's what the writers meant, which shows how tricky it can be to not let a character finish a sentence. Though it's a very powerful dialogue technique, it echoes real life where often we talk over one another, we don't really hear what someone else is saying, we don't let someone finish, or they cut off and don't finish the thought. But there are some perils there in writing because a a reader or viewer like me might interpret that cut off thought very differently. I don't know that that's a flaw, though, because the many ways that you can interpret scenes in Buffy, whether it's from different characters perspective or what you bring to it, which sometimes can change at one point of life and another, is part of why Buffy holds up so well to rewatches. And more comments from Rebecca in the foreshadowing section because they deal with how Spike leaving town plays out. So stay tuned for that. And thank you so much, Rebecca, for your comments. If you are listening and would like to comment, the best way is to email me at BuffyStoryPod at gmail.com. Willow, overwhelmed, says all this emotion, all this pain is too much. She has to make it stop, make it all go away. Willow levitates out of the room, surrounded by flashing magical lighting at 18 minutes into the episode. This is a bit early for the two-episode arc, but I see it as the last major plot turn, what I think of as the three-quarter turn. That turn should grow from the midpoint reversal or commitment and take the story in another new direction. At the midpoint reversal, Buffy could not stop Willow or protect Anya, and neither could Giles. And now there is a huge turn because Willow is far more dangerous. She has taken Giles' power, and she has a new aim. Before, she was focused on killing the geeks. Now she wants to end the world. Talk about raising the stakes, which that last plot turn often does. At the graveyard, Xander tries to break into a crypt to hide everyone, but he is having no luck. Jonathan and Andrew taunt him about how ineffective he is. He argues with them. Dawn sees the fireball heading for them, asks what that is. Buffy races into the cemetery, pushes Jonathan and Andrew out of the way of the fireball, but it hits and Xander is knocked out. The ground shakes. It's like an earthquake and a huge hole opens in the earth. Dawn screams and falls in. Buffy reaches for her and falls in after her. At 20 minutes, 18 seconds, two swords fall in one after the other and stick point first into the ground. Just on this watch, I realized those are probably the two swords Jonathan and Andrew had in the last episode. Up until this time, I thought Willow somehow threw them in there because later she will send those monsters for Buffy to fight. But I think those are Jonathan and Andrew's swords. There's also a coffin there. Jonathan and Andrew stare down into the hull. Jonathan looks at Andrew and says, Mexico, huh? They both run. This ends or continues a conversation they had in part one where Andrew wanted to run away, maybe to Mexico. And Jonathan at the time said no, they were going to stay and face what they had done. But now, uh, as David Fury says on the DVD, we see that Jonathan, though he has had some growth, is still a weasel and they take off. In the magic box, Anya awakens. So for the first time, we know for sure she is not dead. She runs to Giles, who is lying on the floor. She apologizes for letting Willow free. Giles tells Anya he can see Willow. She took Giles' magic and is planning to end the world. 
Giles is dying, but he said he thought this was the only way there'd be a chance to save Willow. At 22 minutes, 53 seconds, Buffy tries to climb the earthen walls of that giant hole she and Dawn are in. She falls down. She yells for Xander. Dawn thinks that this looks like the area under Spike's crypt and suggests that one of the tunnels might lead to his place. Buffy says that's the last place they need to be. And Dawn points out, then why was it good enough to take Dawn there after what Spike did to Buffy? And Buffy says what he and Dawn says tried to do, whatever. And Buffy says Xander, realizing that's who must have told Dawn. Dawn asks if it's true and why Buffy didn't tell her. Buffy says Dawn didn't need to know. Dawn argues she's not a kid anymore. Buffy yells that she's trying to protect Dawn. And Dawn tells her to look around. People around her keep dying, and Buffy can't protect her. Xander yells down to them, tells them Jonathan and Andrew left, and he almost falls in, too. At Buffy's urging, he leaves to go try to find a rope. It's daytime now. Anya then appears... Actually, I think she appears before Xander leaves, so he hears part of this. She teleports in to Buffy and Dawn, fills them in, tells them things are worse, end of the world worse. Willow is going to a big satanic temple at Kingman's Bluff. Buffy says there's not a temple there. And the scene cuts to Willow. She's got her hands out, and the temple is rising from the ground. Anya explains to Dawn and Buffy that the demon associated with the temple had followers who meant to end the world, and now Willow is using this new magic from Giles to channel the demon and carry out the followers' wishes. She also tells him Giles said that no magic or supernatural force can stop Willow. Anya doesn't know what that means, but she has to go. There's not much time left for Giles. Buffy and Dawn are distraught when they realize that Giles is dying. After Anya's gone, Buffy yells for that rope. She doesn't care what Giles said. She's going to try to get out, not just sit there while Willow incinerates what Buffy's chosen to protect. This last statement always rings a little hollow to me. It's a bit in line with Buffy's lecturing tone in the last part where, yes, she's saying the things Buffy would say, but there isn't quite that emotion or power behind it. So maybe it is supposed to feel that way. Telepathically, Willow hears what Buffy says and responds, and Giles can hear this too. Willow's annoyed again at Buffy, says Buffy's always thinking she's saving the world, but Willow is really going to do that, and Buffy asks by killing everyone. Willow says it's the only way to stop the pain. She can't take it anymore, but she goes on that Buffy is a warrior, and Willow knows she won't go out without a fight. Willow doesn't have time for it, but Buffy should fight. Now Willow says, it was me who took you out of the earth. Well, now the earth wants you back. And at 28 minutes, 30 seconds, these earth or dirt demons burst out of the earthen walls, ready to attack Buffy and Dawn. And on the DVD, David Fury commented that originally he wrote the script for Buffy and Dawn to be down in those tunnels beneath Sunnydale. Some of them are sewer tunnels, and they would be on this island they get to after going through all this water, and the demons would be these muck or mud demons coming out of the water. But it wasn't quite working after talking it through with the other writers. It hit him. It's because Buffy needs to climb up out of that grave, and they shifted the scene to this one, and they became Earth Monsters. He didn't sound super thrilled with the Earth or Dirt Monsters, but thematically and metaphorically felt that it fit much better. This moment with these Earth Monsters could be seen at the start as the start of the climax of the two-part episode because it is the first moment of the final battle and there's two of those going on there's Buffy battling these earth monsters and there is Willow 
trying to end the world. Part of why it doesn't have a lot of power is exactly the reason Willow says. It's sort of a, oh, let's get Buffy out of the way and give her something to do. Sure, Buffy and Dawn are in peril, but if the world ends, they're going to die anyway. So of course Buffy is going to fight, but it's a fight that can't change the ultimate outcome. It also shows the challenge of the protagonist here. The climax is the final battle between antagonist and protagonist, and the protagonist wins, loses, or has a mixed result. And here, Buffy is not really the protagonist because she is not directly fighting Willow, although she sort of is by proxy. I'll talk later about whether Giles is the protagonist here, but he also is not going to have a direct battle with Willow. So it is a different feel than a lot of climaxes. Buffy, true to character, grabs a sword and fights the monsters, but there are too many. And now there is a wonderful moment. She turns to Dawn at 29 minutes, four seconds, and says, they just keep coming. I can't take them all. Dawn, will you help me? And she hands over her sword, and Dawn says, I got your back. Buffy takes the other sword, and they both fight. So a wonderful moment of connection. And as I talk about in the bonus episode I did for patrons, it has emotional resonance, and it would have more if I felt more strongly that throughout season six, the issue was Buffy wanting to protect Dawn. And while that is in season six, the bigger issue, I think, from Dawn's perspective is Buffy's been ignoring Dawn. You could see this as a change in that. Obviously, she's seen Dawn as there. She now sees Dawn as potentially competent, but it kind of ignores the emotional issues, though we will get to those somewhat in a bit. Next, we are going to Willow and what I think of as the real climax of the season. Standing about 10, 12 feet from that temple, Willow intones a spell. There is green energy all around her and electricity. She sends an energy field or magic field at the temple. The earth shakes all around her. We get quick cuts of Buffy with dirt falling down on her and Dawn and the magic box, more wreckage there. Anya sits near Giles, who seems like he's unconscious. And Anya says to him, Giles, don't die, not yet. There are things I want to tell you. Thanks a lot for coming. It was good of you to teleport all this way, though in retrospect, it would have been better if you hadn't come and given Willow all that magic that made her like 10 times more powerful. That would have been a plus. Outside near that temple, though, Xander steps in between Willow and it. Now Xander is taking on the role of protagonist, and he is the one who will oppose Willow throughout. So perhaps as in the previous episode, really the protagonist is the whole group of Buffy's friends, and who is acting for that group changes. As I've talked about before, I look at three things to try to sort out who the protagonist is, and that is who is the main point of view character, who has the most screen time, and who has the most at stake. And when it is hard to figure out, that can sometimes make for a story that is not very powerful. As a general rule, it is better to have only one protagonist, but you can have a group or an organization be a protagonist if it is clear enough that one character or another is acting for that group or organization, but you can shift it around. And I do think that's what we see here. In this episode in particular, we get a lot of Giles for much of the episode. He is taking that protagonist role. He's the one directly opposing Willow. Now, Buffy is as well indirectly. Giles will continue in a way to indirectly oppose Willow. He's the one who gave her all that magic that seems to make her, well, does make her more powerful, but it is also working on another level. And now Xander will be the one who finally reaches Willow, but who first has an epic confrontation with her. 
And Xander is absolutely the character to do this for a few reasons. Xander has the most at stake. The fate of the world is at stake for everybody. If Willow prevails, everyone dies. But Xander has had the longest relationship with Willow. He is the closest to her. And I feel like that gives him a little bit more at stake. The way this story has gone and given what we've seen Willow go through all season, Xander is the one who can reach her because the reason Willow is where she is right now, yes, there is the magic addiction aspect, but that is triggered mainly because, as we see, Willow turns to magic to avoid emotional pain, and Xander is the one person who can truly be there with her in that pain and understand a lot of what she's feeling, and he still loves her. His first objective, at least it seems very sincere, is to want to be with her, to be in that moment, not to try to change her, tell her she's doing the wrong thing, tell her to be something else, lecture her as Buffy did, fight her. He wants to be there. And I think that some of Xander's ongoing feeling sorry for himself, feeling like a coward, feeling ineffective, is there not only to show that Xander has some growth, because I'm, I'm not really sure he does grow. I think it is there more to show why he can empathize with Willow and show that there are strengths as well as weaknesses in Xander's key qualities, what we normally see, or at least certainly what Anya has seen as negatives, his joking around, uh, some of his self-loathing because Willow is feeling self-loathing throughout this season. She's used magic to avoid grief. She brought Buffy back, yes, to save her friend from suffering. She believed Buffy might be suffering, but also to avoid her own grief. When she thinks her spell failed in bargaining, she's devastated, and now Buffy's really gone. And throughout the season, we see this. And I'll talk more about that in the next episode where I break down the season arc for Willow. But a lot of her pain is feeling guilty over that, feeling that she, quote unquote, should be able to handle things better, fear that somehow she made things worse by bringing Buffy back. And I, I guess I shouldn't say somehow because there are a lot of consequences from that. And I don't think anyone would say, oh, we wished we didn't bring Buffy back. But Buffy has certainly been acting like that in a lot of ways. And I'm thinking that must feel like a bit of a personal rejection for Willow as well and feed into her self-doubt that she did the wrong thing. Now she has killed somebody and the old Willow definitely would have felt horrible about that and Willow is holding all that at bay and Xander who has so many feelings about himself that are negative can really relate to that in a way that I don't think the other characters can at least not with the depth plus Xander has always loved Willow as we're going to see from day one as is going to be illustrated here he starts out with a bit of a joke something Anya might scoff at and says hey black eyed girl what you doing Willow is not amused any more than Anya would be and she tells him to get out and he responds you're not the only one with powers you know you may be a hopped up uber witch but this carpenter can drywall you into the next century she knocks him aside but starts looking a little disturbed and in the magic box giles tells anya it's not over Happy New Year to everyone. I probably said that in the last episode, but this is the first one that I am recording after the new year. I hope your 2024 has started well. The bonuses I wanted to put out in the regular podcast feed got a little bit thrown off. The very Buffy holiday episode was supposed to come out on a Monday, just as the the regular podcast does. And with all the holiday activities, I didn't realize that although I scheduled it, for some reason it didn't release. Once I realized that, I put it out. And hopefully you all heard that and enjoyed it. I had also hoped to share with you 
on New Year's Day an episode from the podcast Wolferman Cast, which is an Angel Rewatch podcast that was nice enough to share one of my episodes with its listeners. But we had a little bit of crust wires. I did not have the Wolferman Cast episode to share with you. As soon as that's worked out, I will share it. I think you will really enjoy it. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I'm really excited to be finishing up season six and looking forward to season seven. And a special thank you to all the patrons who support the podcast. Buffy and Dawn are still fighting. Dawn does a fantastic job doing a back somersault out of the way, leaping up and stabbing a monster, then slicing its head off. Buffy looks a little amazed, and Dawn says, What? You think I never watched you? And I do love this moment. I love this Dawn and this connection. It always gives me goosebumps because Dawn really seems like she's coming into her own here and Buffy is seeing it. More monsters attack and Buffy and Dawn back to back are ready to fight them off. Near the temple, it looks like there's a storm around Willow and Xander. Xander, clearly injured, struggles to his feet. Willow tells me he can't stop this. But it does stop as they talk. And Xander says, you've been my best friend my whole life. World going to end. Where else would I want to be? And Willow says, is this the master plan? You're going to stop me by telling me you love me? Xander says, well, I was going to walk you off a cliff and hand you an anvil, but it seemed kind of cartoony. Which is a little bit of a reference to season five and the things they did to get rid of glory or contemplating. There was a scene when Anya talked about dropping a piano, I think, on her head, or maybe it was an anvil. And it fits Xander's joke. So this is that sometimes weakness where instead of dealing with things, he jokes, but mainly a strength. This joking allows him to lower the temperature, to start connecting with Willow because she has always loved that, and to bring some perspective. Xander goes on to say that he knows Willow is in pain, and her lip trembles a bit as he tells her even if she does something apocalyptically evil, he still wants to hang. He says her name, and she tells him not to. And Xander says, the first day of kindergarten, you cried because you broke the yellow crayon and you were too afraid to tell anyone. You've come pretty far, ending the world, not a terrific notion, but the thing is, yeah, I love you. I loved crayon breaking Willow, and I love scary, veiny Willow. So if I'm going out, it's here. If you want to kill the world, well, then start with me. I've earned that. And Willow says, you think I won't? And Xander tells her, it doesn't matter. I'll still love you. And that crayon breaky Willow thing always breaks my heart. And it reminds us Xander is the one who has known Willow since kindergarten. And that makes him the most able to speak to what is still in Willow from before magic. And she has felt so disconnected from that self. She talked earlier in the season and maybe the previous season about how Tara didn't even know that girl and her fear that without magic, there was nothing special about her. And Xander is reminding her of who she was and that he loved that Willow. He loved Willow before magic. He loved Willow before any of this. As he repeats that he loves her, she inflicts more and more wounds on him using magic, but her power is fading. Some of those veins are fading from her face. The electricity becomes less strong and eventually turns into just some crackling sparks. Xander keeps staggering toward Willow. She keeps telling him to stop, and finally he hugs her, and Willow cries for the first time since Tara was killed. She's hammering at Xander with her fists when she can't do magic anymore, but then she just cries, and they hold each other and crouch down to the ground as he cradles her and tells her he loves her. And now her hair goes back to its normal color, and all traces of magic are gone. Underground, the monsters disappear. And that makes sense because it fits with Willow by proxy battling Buffy, but it also undercuts some of Buffy's battle because it's not that she wins, it's that they disappear. But Buffy's real subplot isn't fighting the monsters, it's reconnecting with Dawn, so we will go back to that. The climax resolved the conflict 
ended. It's weird to say it's a win because this was so heartbreaking and it isn't like a battle where Xander prevailed in a battle, but it's a win because Willow was stopped. She didn't end the world. Xander did save the world. And there is so much emotional resonance with him connecting with Willow. And I kind of love that this is one Buffy finale where it is less about or it is not about a physical fight ultimately there are plenty of physical battles or magical battles a mix of both but it is about Willow dealing with her emotions and Xander helping her get there and being there for her now we're at the falling action part of the story where the writers tie up loose ends and resolve any subplots Giles now revived at least somewhat sits Anya hugs him he tells her Willow's been stopped Xander did it and Willow is still alive and the magic did what Giles hoped Anya grasps that Giles knew that Willow would take the powers all along Giles tells her it was the true essence of magic not like Willow's which came from power and anger and vengeance he adds at Anya's prompting. This magic tapped into Willow's spark of humanity, helped her feel, and gave Xander the chance to reach her. Anya is surprised it was Xander, and Giles smiles and says Xander saved them all. On the DVD, David Fury said this causes Anya to reevaluate Xander. I'm not quite sure that's warranted. I don't know that Anya's whole view of Xander ought to change. Maybe she can see a little more that his joking and his love for his friends is more of a strength than she realized and that he does have good qualities, which Anya always knew she just has been too heartbroken to see it. So maybe it's about growth for Anya, less than growth for Xander. I think, too, that Xander reaching Willow emotionally is part of why we saw lecturing emotionless Buffy in part one, because it is such a contrast. Buffy is trying to talk Willow into changing how she sees things, but Xander reaches her emotionally. And Dawn or Giles... They couldn't do it. They don't have that connection with Willow. Underground, Buffy now starts to cry. Dawn at first does that petulant thing again, saying sarcastically after they both realize the world didn't end, sorry to disappoint you. But then she realizes it's happy crying, and now Dawn is more quizzical. Didn't Buffy want the world to end? And this seems to make Buffy realize just how... Dawn has seen her since she has come back or how disconnected they are or maybe where Buffy has been at emotionally and the effect on Dawn because she hugs Dawn now and says she's sorry she sees it now and Dawn asks what and Buffy says you things have really sucked lately but it's all going to change and I want to be there when it does I want to see my friends happy again and I want to see you grow up the woman you're going to become because she's going to be beautiful and she's going to be powerful I got it so wrong. I don't want to protect you from the world. I want to show it to you. There's so much that I want to show you. This, I want to show you the world, is a big leap from part one of the episode, which only happened a day ago, and Buffy was dryly lecturing Willow and clearly not feeling it. If the writers had built Buffy's change more and and not wanted such an abrupt switch this would have worked better for me maybe if in part one Buffy had continued to get more in touch with herself with life maybe just had a little bit of genuineness when she was talking to Willow I could buy this more instead it feels to me like they've zigzagged her around and just needed her to say this now so suddenly she has this revelation all the same it's a triumphant moment when at 39 minutes 20 seconds Buffy climbs out of the grave reaching out to Dawn to bring her with up into the world into the sunlight the scene cuts to willow and xander still together also in sunlight willow crying xander holding her then to anya helping giles out of the magic box jonathan and andrew get one last scene they're squeezed into one seat 
the passenger seat in a large truck as the trucker leers at them. Then we see Buffy walking forward into the sunlight. There's flowers all around and Dawn joins her. And through this all, a Sarah McLaughlin song sounds. It's really beautiful. Now we get a game changer. This is where the plot or subplot resolves, but something happens that changes everything going forward. So it's not a cliffhanger. We find out what happens at the end, but then there's a twist that sets off the next installment. And here the game changer is for Spike, but presumably will affect everyone at 40 minutes, 44 seconds. The scene cuts to badly bloodied and bruised Spike lying on his back on the cave floor. His subplot resolves because the demon says Spike endured the required trials and Spike says, make me what I was so Buffy can get what she deserves. And for the first time, this isn't said with a ton of anger or nastiness. It's just emotional or a demand, but he doesn't sound angry at Buffy. And the demon says, very well. And his hand lands on Spike's chest and glows. And the demon says, we will return your soul. All this time, everything pointed to Spike going there to get his chip out. But it's a game changer because the demon takes him back to what he was before he was a vampire in a way by restoring his soul. It seems in this scene like Spike did not expect that and he screams. And that is it for the episode and for the season six finale. If you want to hear more thoughts on that, I'll be sharing more of the director and writer commentary and my reflections on that in a special bonus for patrons. You can get that and all the bonus content at patreon.com slash Lisa M. Lilly. I am sure I also won't be able to resist talking about it a bit in the next podcast episode because I'm going to cover season three as a whole, mainly focusing on Willow, but it's impossible not to talk about Spike. And in a moment, I'll do some foreshadowing and spoilers for season seven. If you are not sticking around for that, thank you so much for listening. Come back in two weeks for that episode about Willow's season six arc. And we are back for foreshadowing, which includes spoilers. I have another comment from patron Rebecca about Spike getting his soul back. And my comments in the foreshadowing sections of previous episodes about the misdirection here, where it looks so clear that Spike's aim is to get the chip out. And instead, in season seven, it is shown as that was what Spike meant all along to get his soul back. Here's what Rebecca says. The whole thing is just off to me. He looked genuinely appalled at himself for what he almost did to Buffy. So why would he go and say, bitch is going to get what she deserves and keep calling her a bitch when he meets that demon if he wants his soul back? And it doesn't make sense no matter how many times I rewatch it. For a good audience misdirect, it should make sense when you go back and rewatch. If he evilly tried to rape Buffy, why did he purposely get his soul back and not his chip out? But if he is horrified at what he almost did, why the hostility and all the bitches? Either he's evil and hostile and wants his chip out, or he's sorry and wants his soul and wouldn't have been so hostile about it. Sloppy writing, in my opinion, or too many writers? Aside from all that, I truly believe the writers meant for Spike to try to get his chip out. To me, he seemed surprised when the demon said soul. But then over the summer, they realized, hey, we did the get a soul accident thing once already. We should change it to him doing it on purpose. I don't care what the writers or Joss have said. This is what I believe, and I think they're lying. I agree, Rebecca. At the very least, it seems to me that they were leaving it open, were purposely misdirecting the audience so that it could be a big surprise in season seven. But it does seem more likely to me that at the time this was filmed and directed, they really were planning to have it that Spike was surprised because to your point, it is written as if Spike is angry and getting wants to get that chip out because right, he calls Buffy bitch a lot and James Marsters is a fantastic 
actor. So if they had told him to play it ambiguously so that it could be one way or the other, I am positive he would and could have done that awesomely. And instead, his delivery, it's it's pretty clear Spike is angry. And when he says the bitch is going to get what she deserves, he doesn't mean I'm going to get a soul again and be there for Buffy and be the kind of man that I want to be for her. Thank you so much for those comments, which covered pretty much everything I wanted to say on that point. Buffy's comment about someone taking her place. I mentioned I, I wasn't sure that she would think that, but maybe she does think that. We don't know whether the Slayer's succession line is clear at that point. And it's a great foreshadowing of season seven because Buffy is going to meet all those young women and girls who are potential Slayers and might take her place if that's the way the succession line works. But even more so, it foreshadows the issue with Dijoxin's eye when Anya and Giles go there to find out why is the first evil so powerful? Why is it able to act so much more directly? And the eye tells them it's because Buffy's alive. So this idea of a slayer being back from the dead, again, Buffy's now done this twice, really throws things off. I'm not sure why it didn't throw it all off the first time, maybe because she only died for a minute, as she said. Here, it threw the entire universe off balance, and I kind of love the idea that maybe that, too, is part of what feels so wrong to Buffy about being back. There are all the personal reasons she's depressed, but on some level, she might be feeling that cosmic balance being off. She is the slayer. She does have visions, and she does say to Giles she doesn't know what her place is or why she was brought back, and it turns out that could be a, a huge danger to the entire world. These moments between Dawn and Buffy foreshadow how much better their relationship is in season seven. And season seven begins, I haven't rewatched yet, but as best I remember from all my previous rewatches with Buffy training Dawn, I think her first line is it's about power and she's showing Dawn how to fight a vampire. Sadly for Dawn, that gets pretty much dropped when those potential slayers show up. Dawn handles it really well. I like season seven Dawn a lot. I would have liked, too, to see Buffy acknowledging that more. I can't recall if she does at all. If she doesn't, it's understandable, given all the things going on in Season 7. But these scenes feel a bit like a promise that doesn't quite pay off. Yes, things are better between Dawn and Buffy, but we don't get that close relationship or that fighting together. On the other hand, the show has always liked to twist things in a way we don't expect, so maybe that is perfect. Dawn connects, Buffy connects, Buffy's ready to teach Dawn. It looks like that's going to be a terrific part of season seven when it starts, and then cue all these potential slayers to get in the way. Finally, Dark Willow, huge foreshadowing for next season. Willow goes through a sort of rehab with Giles and returns home, but still full of that self-doubt and afraid that if she does magic at all, she will become Dark Willow again. As Buffy says, she's a Wicca who won't because of that fear. She'll do some small things, but anytime it gets dire, she backs off. And I said finally, but there is another thing, Jonathan and Andrew, we get that last moment of them going out of town. David Fury said initially he was going to end it with the comment about Mexico and them running off. But someone else in the writer's room, I don't remember who, thought there should be a quick scene to see if they really did it. So we get that scene of them getting that ride out of the country. Jonathan had a lot of growth to David Fury's point. He's still a weasel, but we'll see that he does try to continue that growth. He does get a redemption arc, but we don't get to see too much of it because Andrew kills him. And then Andrew has a huge redemption arc in season seven, as does Spike. And I feel like I should end with Buffy because though this was not really her season, it was more 
are Willows. It is still her show. And in season seven, we'll see Buffy still struggling to find her place in the world, but in a much different way. She grapples with power, why she has it, and how to lead, which is to me really interesting. That season explores leadership, it explores battles and war, and it explores power and having it, keeping it, sharing it, all through the metaphor of the Slayer. And all of it at the same time is very personal to Buffy. And a lot of it is foreshadowed in this very episode where she has these questions about being back, about the Slayer line, and even about fighting with Dawn. That too foreshadows Buffy becoming someone who trains another generation. I could talk forever about this, but I will stop. Thank you again for listening to this episode. Come back in two weeks for the next episode where I'll talk about why Willow is the protagonist of season six and take a look at her story arc as a whole. Music for this episode was written and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy and the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved. Thank you.